I'll just explain the difference between strike and dip. So these guys heard it, so I'm going to ask them to explain it. <laughs> Sleepy. Sleepy. Yes, dip. If something, yes, if something's dipping, it simply means it's tilted. So these rocks are tilted down very gently that way, towards the southwest. Okay, and the edge running around here is called the strike. So this slope you can see, the Niagara Escarpment, is the strike the edge of these rocks and they are mostly of Silurian age and I just want to point out the difference between the red, the grey and the other rocks and basically we're looking at the difference between shale, that's the red and the grey, relatively soft rocks and then these sandstones which are much much harder and so it's like a sandwich of soft, hard, soft, hard. And then right on the top is the cap rock of the escarpment. It's called the cap rock because it occurs right on the top. It's the hardest unit. Okay, and it's called the Lockport Dollar Stone. Dollar Stone. Now you're probably saying, okay, what is a dollar stone? <laughs> it's a limestone which has been chemically altered. Now, these rocks are at surface. We can drive here, we're looking at them in outcrop, but at one time they were five kilometers down there because we've lost a lot of rocks due to erosion, ice ages, rivers. So we've stripped off a lot of rock. And so we're exposing rocks here at surface that were once very deeply buried. Now, when they're deeply buried, we have fluids moving through them. We talked a bit about groundwater, right? Well, groundwater is fresh water, you can drink it. It's not that far down at depth. And below that, we have basinal fluids. And these are very saline. And they're called brines. Brines, B-R-I-N-E-S, brines. It's like an Australian saying brain, brines. <laughs> Brines. <laughs> I'll come to that. In those brines are other chemicals, and one of the most important ones is the mineral dolomite. Dolomite. Calcium magnesium carbonate. Magnesium carbonate. And it alters the limestone into something called a dollar stone. And it makes it harder. If a dollar. Dollo stone. So it's a combination, <laughs> combination of dolomite plus stone, a dollo stone. So the cap rock all the way around the escarpment top is made out of dollo stone. The Lockport dollo stone is hard, it's tough. What's it sitting on? Soft rock, soft shale. So the river, we'll, we'll go through this tomorrow, but the river is undercutting the soft rocks. So this hard cap rock collapses. It gets undercut. That's a good question. 400 million years ago, this was at the equator, but Africa was just out there, colliding with Eastern North America. What was that part of? This big cycle. Why was Africa colliding with North America? What was it making? Pangaea. Yeah, this was Pan Pangaea coming together. Almost, just, just, just to the east, along the modern coast of North America, the Appalachian Belt. Remember, the Appalachian Belt is the result of the collision, so there would have been volcanoes, subduction, lots of big rivers carrying sediment. So these rivers would have transported huge volumes of mud into the interior of North America. That gives us the shales. Okay? And then those volcanoes stop erupting, the mountains get worn down, nice quiet water organisms living in the sea. That gives us our limestones. So you see this basic alternation between what we call clastic rocks, 
Well, remember what plastic rock is? Hot rock? Oh, wait, it's close. Plastic means to break. Well, pyroclastic have been broken by fire, by igneous activity. Sedimentary rocks, plastic rocks, are the product of the breaking down of older rocks. Okay, so we talk about sandstone and shale being a plastic rock because they're derived from the weathering of yet older rocks. And then we have the carbonates, limestone, dollar stone, which are non-plastic. It's a large part of their makeup is made up of fossil material. Okay, so just bear that distinction in mind that there is a, a nice record of the building of Pangaea that's in these rocks. And whenever we see limestones, dollar stones, it means there wasn't much in the way of mountain building. Things were pretty quiet. And then when we see the shales and the sandstones, it was big deltas building over this part of North America. So it's an interesting tectonic story in, in, in these rocks. And um, when we have active mountain building, what do we get in terms of processes? These are pretty dangerous areas. Why? We've got volcanic activity. What else? Earthquakes. Very good. If you look at these two here, you see these big deformed masses. I mean, you can see deformed bedding in there and there, right? These two big pillows. And um, very often when you shake at the ground in earthquakes, you get sand volcanoes. Because of higher pore water pressures in the subsurface, it literally erupts. And uh, this was seen in the 1880s in the Charleston earthquake down in the States. You get these big sand volcanoes. And uh, that's probably, that's probably what we call a diapir, a diapir. You've probably heard about that term in igneous rocks, a diapiric intrusion. But you can also get saturated wet sediment that's pushed up and formed a sand volcano on the seafloor. Um, but you've got to look at the geometry, the structure of the deposits. So if it's a seismite, you're going to find it over a huge area, maybe hundreds of square kilometers. If it's a storm deposit, it's going to be more local. And then if it's a landslide too, it too will have a distinct geometry. Okay. But the bottom line is identifying ancient environments from rocks using structures. Okay. It's not massive. All right. Massive means unstructured. This is very well structured in the form of bed. So you're looking at discrete episodes of deposition. And the good question was, well, how much time does that whole thing record? And it may be several million years of the whole thing, but it may be very short periods of deposition, and then nothing happens. And then very short periods of deposition, maybe storms bringing in sediment, and then nothing. So the whole thing spans probably a couple of million, but the actual amount of time <coughs> to deposit that is much shorter. Yes, because you're looking at discrete events that brought in sediment and then nothing happened. And then thousands of years later, more sediment was brought in. So the rate of deposition probably didn't remain constant. Now, when we go to Niagara Falls, we'll see the Lockport, but it's very different. It's massive, hard. So this is relatively soft because it's fractured, embedded. OK? And that's the point, it's fractured. So. If you have um, urban activity on the top, contaminants move through that very, very quickly. And um, there are probably some places where you could get enough water out of that to, to have a well, because it's fractured. Whereas what we'll see later on, it's massive, you wouldn't get any water out of it at all. 
Okay. Mud volcanoes have the same principle as sand volcanoes. Yes, mud volcanoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said mud, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're...